Hey guys, it's Sean, and I'm here to introduce you to a bonus episode of Real Blend. Director Robert Eggers joining the show, or returning to the show, I should say, because we had Eggers on as a guest about two years ago at this point, where he was discussing The Lighthouse. This is his follow-up film called The Northman. It is a terrific, brutal, intense film uh, that has a vengeance thread to it. And as you're going to hear in the conversations that we had with Robert about uh, his approach to this film... He considers it the, uh, the the closest thing that Robert Eggers is going to get to making a popcorn movie. And I get what he's talking about, but even at that, this is not like a traditional summer blockbuster uh, or something that you would see coming from one of the major studios. And that's kind of why it makes sense that uh, Eggers is teaming up with A24 to bring something like the North Mint to theaters. Uh, this one, absolutely, I know we say this a lot, but this is without a doubt a, th a theatrical experience. You have to go see this uh, on the biggest screen possible with uh, hopefully one of the best sound systems available to you, the way that he mixes uh, the battle uh, sequences and then the the use of music, which is something that we start the interview off with, is truly fantastic uh, and makes this a really unique experience. And so uh, I want I want Eggers to tell you all about it and, and dive into uh, the filmmaking techniques behind the Northman, uh, as well as some talk about uh, the witch um, and and the lighthouse leading up to it. So uh, here's the real blend, guys. All three of us together uh, for this particular interview, speaking with Robert Eggers on be on behalf of the Northman. <laughs> Uh, Robert, we're all tremendous, tremendous fans of this film. Uh, it was really outstanding, and I can't wait for more people to get a chance to see it, especially in a theater, because the first thing uh, that really grabbed me was your use of music. Um, it's it's booming and it's tribal, and, and thank God the theater that I saw it in had it cranked up to about 11, uh, and it pulled me right to the edge of my seat, and I basically stayed there. So I just want to know what kind of conversations you had with Robin and Sebastian, uh, just to make sure that they achieved uh, the mood that you wanted to set for this film. Well, Robin is one of my closest friends, so he kind of knows what I'm about. And uh, and so, you know, and we had a lot of conversations. We also like recorded a few demo tracks before we even made the movie, uh, you know, and uh, and I, I, I chanted in one of those tracks and lost my voice on take one because I was no like, way. So hard. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean this we've I've never had so much movie music in a film. I think the movie the, the movie is like two hours and 15 minutes. And I think that it's two two hours of composed music. I wow. mean it really it really is like this muscular thing that's driving us and, and leading us through. But it was but but also but I don't want to have it be like a TV show where we're like telegraphing emotion either. So it was like a tricky balance to like always have something to kind of help hold the audience's hand without like spoon feeding and like jamming it down their throats. But mm -hmm. but it is aggressive. And Robin has said that he never wants to hear another drum. <laughs> <laughs> Just one last thing, like, you know, like unsurprising for me, like the lead instruments are all Viking age instruments and we, you know, have like Viking, hypothetical Viking age singing styles. So it should, should be a fairly unique uh, sounding score. Oh, that's awesome. Mm. I actually would love to have it on vinyl. I feel like this just, it would just play well with some sort of crackle of that. Yes. Sacred, well. Sacred Bones is releasing it on vinyl. You should check it out. It's a very, uh, I, you know, I designed the cover myself. Uh, it, you should. Hell you, yeah. To check it out absolutely uh, awesome yeah i guarantee you just sold three right here and we <laughs> yeah. haven't even published this yet um robert you know all of your films are obviously they're just so big and bold and and, and unique and unconventional sort of in the more uh, traditional hollywood sense of the word and i'm really curious if you could just take me into your pitch meetings like what are those meet when you're sitting down with a, the, uh, what i imagine to be like the long board of all the, the studio heads and execs and you would tell them what you want to do what what is that that those meetings like, what are those meetings like what is the vibe like in those rooms the thing with so i you know it was sometimes it's friggin' weird because you know and i also have learned that i need to say like all the crazy scary stuff that like a studio doesn't want to hear like right up front <laughs> because if people like, you know, run away screaming, then I know it's not a good fit. But if they can bear it, like even if they feel like, OK, like 10 percent of that's going to have to change. Yeah. But I can pretend to get through the meeting. Can you give me an example yeah. of like what something like that would be like? What would what would be an example of something that you would want to just get in and get out of the way really quickly? Well, I mean, the lighthouse was in black and white and in a stupid aspect ratio and like had a mermaid vagina or whatever, you know, or mermaid vulva. <laughs> Um, in any case, uh, with the Northman, I was in a very special circumstance because 
Shion and I had finished a, a draft of the, of the Northman that was like decent enough to share with people right before Can, and then the Lighthouse did well at Can, and so then I kind of said, "Hey, like, how about a Viking movie? You know, I'm gonna make the most entertaining Robert Eggers movie I've ever tried to make. It's gonna be a, a popcorn eating Robert Eggers movie, and um, like, what do you think about that?" And everyone said, okay, like, let's check it out. And then thankfully, thanks to the History Channel's Viking show, inspiring other mm. TV shows and video games, and also the Marvel nonsense, uh, like there is a hunger for Viking content. So mm -hmm. shock of the century, like, you know, uh, we got to make a large scale, uh, non-IP, non-comic book movie in this climate. Whoa. Mm. Whoa. You know, Robert, th this is going to sound like it's coming from a joking perspective, but it's not. I and mean, because yesterday I talked to you a lot about the cinematography and the aspect ratio choices from The Witch to The Lighthouse and to here and you have the changes that you made, the one the one one nine uh, in The Lighthouse as well. But I, and this is going to sound like a joke, but it's not. I feel like fart humor is actually something that's underrated in films. I, re I really do. And I think you did a brilliant job with it in The Lighthouse. And, and again, The Lighthouse is about so many different things and misery and there's so many things that are happening in that. And this is just one little thing I'm picking out. Um, but even in this film, there's another you do it a bit in the beginning. And I find that to be really interesting from a tonal perspective. You get it works in these worlds. And I wonder, like, how you balance that. And are you like, are those done in post? I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely asking you not from a joking perspective. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, like, I, I'm not like if Bosch and Bruegel and Cervantes and Shakespeare can like make like scatological works of art and like, you know, certainly someone as uh, humble as me can, can do that. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, uh, you know, some of, some of the burping and farting is real and some of it is, uh, it, you know, enhanced in post-production. Uh, but, you know, uh, it is, you know, it's part of life. What can yeah. I say? It's part of life. Mm. And by the way, I'm like, this is the second time I've talked about this today. So like now I, I'm like somehow like the biggest fan of this movie, but I watched the road to Wellville recently. Oh like, yeah. Pretty good. And it was totally panned like, cause people couldn't get behind the scatological humor. Well, I'm glad that times have changed. <laughs> You're talking. You're to somebody, on the right show, yeah. sir. I appreciate. I think you tonally do it perfectly. Like that, I don't think it's easy to do that either. You do it perfectly in these films. So, Too kind. all right. So I can't wait to own this film um, just so I can analyze uh, the first scene, the first attack on the Slav village where Alexander is working his oh. way through, um, and and you you have this sort of it's chaos, but it's very controlled. Um, and so I want you to talk a little bit about how long it takes to choreograph something like that and your decision to choose that you keep what I think are really fluid movements with a camera as opposed to another director who might use like handheld and sort of plunge into the action. We're allowed to sort of, you know, move along with him and trace it through. It's a wonder. Oh, my God. Ugh. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the it's like, you know, obviously that's the that's the wonder that everyone's like talking about and freaking out about and asking me about. But like, you know pretty much the whole damn movie, except for if they're yeah. like with the, 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 the scenes with the witches are shot reverse shot, but pretty much everything else is shot like that. I mean, you know, right. the raid is two, the raid is actually two shots. Okay. And, but like the, the scene with the undead warrior in the mound, like that's two shots, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, you know, but, but, but obviously the one with the most like, uh, hundreds of extras and horses and stuntmen and cows and chickens and goats and sheep and geese and children and arrows and axes and javelins and spears like is the one that everyone's like That's excited awesome. to know about just that <laughs> just that um, it's but, immersive man a spear it's awesome well thanks and i just i mean look i think uh you know jaren and i prefer uh crane you know, crane and dolly work. We don't really like the handheld stuff. Uh, not that I mean, there's plenty of handheld movies that I love, but I just feel like, like sometimes you are just aware of the of the camera operator. Mm. When you know, like not you know, I'm just really I'm just saying like for a reason why we don't like it. You know, I'm not saying that's always the case. Um, but but even Steadicam is like we use Steadicam a couple times in the movie, and I wish we hadn't. You know, we we use it in the in the in the ball game, the violent Knot Laker 
game. Oh God, I love that sequence. Because the, ro- the the location was so remote that like we were getting a lot of uh, pushback to use this incredibly remote location where we had a helicopter actors in. So one of the compromises was that we said we would use Steadicam there. Uh, but um, anyway, you want to know about the scene that you want to know about. So it took a long time. I mean, what can I tell you? Like we storyboarded it. We, pl- we planned it. We re-storyboarded it, <clears throat> worked countless hours with CC Smith, the stunt coordinator, uh, you know, and we, and he would look at the storyboards and say, sorry, sorry, gents, like a horse is never going to do that. Okay. Back to, <laughs> back to the storyboards. Uh, you know, the horses had to be trained to do all the things they were doing. And then, you know, we built the, the, the village from, from scratch to shoot this sequence. So, you know, there, there were many, many times where we showed up to this uh, location, you know, Jaron and I, and like a whole lot of people and Jaron's got the viewfinder and we've got a tape measure and all the buildings are just like staked out and taped. And, you know, and we're talking to Craig Lathrop, the production designer and Rob, the art director. And we're saying, you know, that building's got to move like a foot to the left and that moving building, we got to can't like 25 degrees, like counterclockwise and this, you know, just so that we can make sure we see every single thing, you know? And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lot of work, but, but, uh, but because we planned it so well, it wasn't like a nightmare. It was hard. I mean, it was hard, but it wasn't like a nightmare. Uh, Robert, you know, you've obviously worked with multiple actors on on more than one occasion, uh, Anya Taylor-Joy and Willem Dafoe being examples. But in each of those instances, they're playing wildly different characters. So I'm curious, does that at all affect your experience with them? Or does the same actor make for the same experience regardless of the character they're playing? Well, uh, you know, Willem, in when we were doing press for the lighthouse spoke so generously about like the process of making the lighthouse but sometimes like me and jaron's way of shooting fr- did frustrate him on set you know but now he knows how we work so he was like you know just uh, like co- completely comfortable and and knew what that would be like and it's the same thing with 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 anya and and you know and alex who was you know, this movie wouldn't have happened without Alex. You know, I didn't want to make a Viking movie. Uh, Alex, we wanted to make a Viking movie since he was a kid. Like some, you know, maybe we'll get into it, but like some stuff happened, yada, yada, yada. We had lunch, shook hands. We're making a Viking movie. Okay. And then that, and and after, and, and so with the best intentions, it still took a couple of weeks for Alex to like get behind how Jaren and I uh, work, you know, mm-hmm. like, and, to, and, 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 you know, and so, so working with with actors that you already know and you already trust, you're able to like get right in there, you know, immediately, which is such a great mm-hmm. feeling. And uh, but yeah, I mean, I think um, things change when you're playing a different role, but but you don't generally change your acting technique. And I'm certainly not changing my directing technique. <laughs> sure, sure. You know, I, I found this interesting because I was talking to you yesterday uh, for the television junket about this and 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 our audience, what, what we like about our audience is they come to our show to learn about filmmaking. They they want to know about the behind the scenes and the concept of like why a director chooses a certain uh, aspect ratio or whatever. Um, but yesterday, I, I kind of wanted you to expand a bit yesterday on what you were talking about in terms of the three films that were you have, The Witch, The Lighthouse and now The Northman. Um Actually, I didn't realize they all have the before them just now. I just realized that um, to put that together. Sorry. Um, but in terms of aspect ratio, it is fascinating. And I was wondering if you just walk our audience through a bit of your decision making process of kind of how you decided on which one, because for people who are listening to our show, not a lot of people pay attention to the black bars and the right or the left or the top and the bottom of the screen. But there's so much that goes into that thought process from a storytelling standpoint that blew my mind when I talked to you yesterday. I just wanted you to expand on that again as well. I think it's just fascinating fascinating yeah i mean i watch a lot of old movies and like and honestly like it's the most comfortable for me to frame in 133 or 137 and my two short films that are not bad somehow my terrible shitty hansel and gretel somebody posted on youtube it's a fucking (laughs) terrible movie i don't know who found it you're so hard on yourself man i I think (laughs) you're so hard on yourself fucking garbage anyway (laughs) but but after that you know and that but my my two short films after that were shot in 133 so then the witch it was 166 yeah uh, and uh which it, it shooting with a spherical lens 
is actually a taller aspect ratio, like rather than a skinnier aspect ratio, because, you know, if, if you could, if you could go to a certain cinema that was built purpose built for each aspect ratio, that cinema would actually be like taller rather than not as wide, you know, if you think about it that way. Uh, but basically, and that was, and we didn't want to, I didn't want to shoot in one, three, three, because I just needed a little bit more. I didn't need a little more width because there's five characters in the, in the film. And I knew that we were going to be like wanting some st some staging that wasn't too confined horizontally, but I wanted the extra height to capture the looming presence of the trees. Yeah. So that's why that was one, six, six. And then the lighthouse was one nineteen to one, which is a rare sound aspect ratio and that uh like early sound aspect ratio i mean to say uh and so for uh, like first thing it does is it says old you know mm -hmm. and but then what it is doing is creating like it's very good for claustrophobic confined spaces and mm -hmm. it's also good for close-ups like very mm -hmm. good for close-ups and it's also very good for framing vertical objects, like say a lighthouse tower. <laughs> uh, you know, then like with with the Northmen, again, you know, part of me wanted to do it in one three three three, and also you have like Viking architecture is very vertical. Mm -hmm. um, it's you know inside, like outside, it's very wide, but inside it's very vertical. Um, but so, 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 so shooting in scope felt like just too wide. Uh, and, and, and also I know this sounds insane in the, like, in, in with cinema history, like behind me, uh, to say that I find like center framed close-ups in scope to be anemic, like, cause it's just like, what's all this shit here? Like, we don't need that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so we chose one, like two to one, because it was wide enough to give us like our vistas and our landscapes and to shoot the battle scenes the way we, we needed to. Uh, but it made the close ups a little bit less an anemic than they might have been. But I still mm -hmm. is, you know, it's funny. And it was it was hard for me, actually, when we did the camera test, it was like getting used to like sh framing that way. You know, I mean, I, I know David Lowry when he did ghost story said, said that he had to like reshoot the first week or two or something because he oh, was wow. so, so unused to shooting in one, three, three. And for me, it's like the opposite. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, ghost story is a masterpiece, by the way. I, I David, that, that film, I know David did a great job with that as well, but like that aspect ratio, was, it was meant for that. It was claustrophobic. Sure. You were, it was, it, I appreciate you explaining that. I think people need to understand how much thought goes into that choice. Well, so, I mean, so yeah. as we were, as we were, and by the way, I, I don't want to like knock Chris, Chris Nolan. And, and I don't think I could make a movie like this without like a lot of the things that he did paving the way change commercial cinema but I, this like idea of different like yeah, having the same shot be in like both uh an imax asset back ratio and in scope is completely anathema to my way of thinking like i don't see how that makes sense in my mind there is one frame and that's it like, I don't, I don't, I do not understand that. What about yeah. when Denis, when Dune would jump to the IMAX for the dream sequences, if it was like a narrative or a punctual storytelling? That, that makes sense, but that makes sense to me. But also, but then it's like, but knowing that like certain people are going to always see a cropped version. I mean, yeah. like, it's like, are you, see, do you want to see Tom Hardy like this? Or do you want to see Tom Hardy like this? Like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. they, they do completely different things. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Interesting. Um, um, Robert, we'll get you out of here on this one because we're running out of time. I wish we had I wish we had all day to talk about this. But um, one of the greatest performances that I've seen in the past 20 some odd years is Bjork uh, in Dancer in the Dark. And after 2000, I assumed that she would show up in, in a million things. And she has essentially two or three on screen credits since then. So I just am really curious how you got her in your film and, and how, why she came to mind for the film. Well, obviously, she's the pop culture shamaness of our planet so having her play a serious it, it makes sense and it's you know an icelandic movie um to many in many respects and she is you know uh iceland's greatest import uh, export you know right. from, um, right. so but basically i mean it's honestly it's not that interesting you know robin carolyn one of the composers has worked with bjork and was friends with bjork introduced my wife and i to bjork 
Bjork introduced me to Shion. Shion and Bjork have known each other since they were teenagers. So, you know, it's, it's like that. Oh, I just wasn't sure if she wasn't like not acting, you know, or, you know. Had to, no, she's not. She, she was not acting, but but because of this particular familial environment and, and this role, she was like down, down to do it. Gotcha. Lucky right. me. Yes, lucky awesome. you and lucky for lucky for all the people who are going to get a chance to see this film. Um, we're driving everybody to it. Like I said, it's it's one of the best things I've seen so far this year. And yeah. uh, I, I hope we get you back on the show sometime soon for uh, for your next film, Robert. Thank you for stopping by. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you. Thanks right. for shooting on Take film, care. by the way. Yeah. Thank you. thank you. And again, thank you, Christopher Nolan, for helping to keep it alive. Thank you so much to A24. And thanks to Robert Eggers for coming back on the show. Hopefully he becomes a recurring guest because I really love talking about movies with him. And I think that he, uh, so far, over the course of three movies, has a really fascinating career that's only going to get more interesting as it goes. Uh, thank you for tuning in for the bonus episode. We're going to have a full episode dropping on Friday as well, too, uh, with another interview, another full interview that you guys will enjoy. We're planning a couple of really exciting things as well, too. And uh, talking about getting some type of a live event uh, back together, some type of meetup where the guys are going to be. So make sure you're turned into all of our uh, social channels, including at Real Blend, uh, and then my channel as well too, at Sean underscore O'Connell. As soon as we have details like that, we will drop them as soon as we can. So uh, good to see you guys. We'll be back here Friday with a full episode. Uh, and until then, Larry Crown. <laughs>